So, good morning. Uh, my name is Brennan Kenny. I'm an engineer with the MAP developer relations team, and I mostly work with the JavaScript API, so good old browsers. Um, and so, as you can see, I'm here to tell you a story about um, where maps and browsers and uh, geospatial data kind of meet and, and have make beautiful, beautiful things for us. Um, it says HTML5 up there because I wanted to be cool, I guess. Um, but it's really about modern browsers. Like, what, what are the new things that browsers can bring to the table and uh, allow us to do things that we, that we couldn't do before? So, how are you doing there? There we go. So, the, the kind of catchphrase of the day for visualization is, is process. And um, the reason why that is, and kind of a, a lot of the, the visualization minds out there, the, the great visualization minds out there are focusing on process, is that visualization, it turns out, is really difficult to do well. Um, you know, if we wanted to take it easy, we could get a couple of numbers together and, you know, pick a nice font and maybe some clip art and you could have it like a long vertical thing and it'd be an infographic and you'd get some hits on Reddit and then a bunch of angry people would come in and say, you're bad at statistics. Um, so we could do that. Uh, but if you want to do a visualization that, that's actually valuable and uh, actually gives insight and, and communicates, uh, it takes time. And so uh, what this, you know, kind of uh, thing that, that people have started calling this time is, is process. So uh, Ben Fry, who is one of the uh, co-creators of processing, um, which is, uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a kind of computational sketchbook slash uh, kind of programming environment that's, that's meant, it's great, I, I really like the, the sketchbook part of that. It's meant to kind of just immediately start getting something on the screen and going so that you can start exploring. And uh, in his book on data visualization, uh, he takes the stages of, of process and divides it into these kind of seven categories. And the exact categories aren't that important. There's definitely overlap and we could, you know, probably each have our own definition for these words. But it's, it's actually a, a pretty good way to, to think about it. And uh, what I don't have here, and, and he actually has when he, when he first introduces this in the book, is a bunch of lines or arrows that point back and forth and back and forth. And it turns out that's what you have to do uh, for this process. It's not, it's not, you don't go through stages um, and then get to the end. It turns out you get to midway through and realize you had no idea what you're doing and have to go back to the beginning and, and take care of your data. So now that I have emphasized the importance of these, I'm going to lump the first three together uh, so I can dismiss them as quickly as possible. Um, so these are actually the, the hardest steps. Um, acquire person filter. So this is really about your data, your source data. And it turns out this is often, uh, you know, the, definitely the longest amount of time. It's definitely, it definitely tends to be the most tedious part of a visualization pro project. Um, because just because data tends to be so horrible in the real world, especially as you get larger in the amount of data, I'm going to avoid saying that phrase about voluminous amounts of data. Um, but as, you, as the amount of data you have increases, you know, the likelihood of error increases, um, and just the raw number of uh, even somebody entering wrong things on the keyboard, or uh, much more like subtle but pernicious things like somebody took a survey of data using 1990 census tracts, and somebody else took a survey of data using 2,000 census tracts, and then you want to compare them, but it turns out in your area the census tracts don't actually align, and then you're going to have to make some you know, pretty serious assumptions about how things average over areas that uh, don't intersect, or only intersect, but don't, don't, um, aren't the same. Um, so there's a bunch of tools out there to help you kind of, with these steps, you import the data, you kind of look what's wrong. Um, you know, all the way down from just libraries, you know, a lot of Python libraries exist. Uh, if you're a fan of R, like this is great for it. One thing that I'll put a plug in for is, uh, is OpenRefine, which used to be called Google Refine. Um, it's a great program that you can run, and it's specifically for this type of thing. You put, it in, you put in your data, and, uh, and you run what are called filters. Um, so you say, like, so for this unemployment column, you say, show me everything that's not a number, because this is supposed to be a number. And it might, turns out somebody entered strings in there for some reason. 
And uh, then you can write a really quick little snippet in the little refine uh, programming scripting language to, to correct those. And it turns out this is kind of what, what happens, big or small, what you have to do. You have to look at your data and say, what doesn't belong? And, and there's a lot of tricks that you, you can do to, to get there. So, um, so this is hard. And the kind of data that I want to use for, for WebGL stuff, which we're going to get to in just a second, um, is, it tends to be uh, you know, high in count. And, um, and so there, there tends to be errors in it. And uh, as I said, I'm going to kind of pass over this now because there's an awesome session uh, just after lunch in room one, which is somewhere down the hall, um, called All the Ships in the World. And it's about uh, gathering data from all the ships in the world. Um, so you can imagine that's quite a bit of data. And, uh, and it's a great session specifically about like, how you get kind of nasty, uh, poorly formatted, sometimes just like uh, just erratic data, clean it up, put it through a pipeline so that you can process that large uh, volume of data, and then, uh, and then start serving it fast enough that you can start doing interactive queries on it. And, uh, and so you can actually take a look at things and a little graph and say, oh, well, that little part, that little lump in that distribution does not belong there, so let's go figure out what that is. Um, so I definitely recommend it, uh, 12.45 after lunch. So what we're going to do is treat that course as a, as a little black, an awesome black box, and, uh, and use their data. So we're going to take a look at uh, all the ships in the world, uh, and, just, and just try our hand at visualizing it and kind of exploring the data. So this is about the process of, of uh, kind of figuring out what are the interesting stories here. So the data comes from SpaceQuest, a company called SpaceQuest. And it turns out that ships broadcast a bunch of data about themselves. They, they have uh, transmissions that they send out periodically talking about you know, who they are, where they are, what, are they, what they're doing. Um, and it's primarily for collision avoidance and you know, in uh, harbors and, and things like that for, for kind of traffic control. Um, but they just, it, all the ships broadcast it out. And so Space Coast has, has a satellite overhead, and, and they pick it up, and they, and they, um, and they log it. And so, they, we've partnered with them to kind of explore what's possible, like if we, if we were to visualize this kind of data, what, what kind of things could we do? Um, so, so let's talk about represent, representations, finding a representation. Um, so this is, a, this is something that's part of my personal process, finding a, something on screen as quickly as possible um, so that I can get a look at the data and see what's going on. So a year ago at, at I.O., I, I released a library called Canvas Layer. Um, it's in the Google Maps utility library. If you just look for Canvas Layer, one word, it's usually in the, in the top hits. Um, so it's a Maps API. How many people here are familiar with the, the Maps API, the JavaScript Maps API? OK, would you rate yourself as you have made more than two maps that you didn't directly copy paste from the samples? <laughs> yeah? OK, I mean, no, it's totally fine. I just am curious about what level of detail I should go into. So, uh, so the Maps API has a concept called overlays. And they're exactly what they sound like. Chrome doesn't like when I go full screen to other tabs. OK. So this is a ground overlay. And it's literally uh, an image put on top of the ground. And, uh, and so the key thing with overlays is the kind of overlays in the Maps API parlance is that you take an object and it's associated with a point in the world. And so when you move and when you zoom, it stays put at that point. So that's great. And the, you, know, you can do nice things like overlay historical data on top of here. So Canvas Layer is a, is a layer because it doesn't quite do that, but it, it, it tries to emulate that. Does that actually work? Oh, cool. Uh, there we go. So Canvas Layer um, takes an HTML5 canvas and puts it right on top of a map and, uh, and lets you draw anything that you want to Canvas. And if you're not familiar, Canvas is supposed to be like a dynamic image element. And so it originally had a 2D API. It's based off like drawing APIs of old. Um, but then um, more recently, there's a 3D API was added, WebGL, which is Kind of based on it's it's based on OpenGL ES uh, two, but it's basically OpenGL bindings, um, emulated or not, through the browser. So you can use the the canvas as your as your place to draw. I'm sure most people have seen a WebGL thing by now. Well, I guess we saw a bunch yesterday. 
So, so here's our canvas. And the main thing is, oh, that's not good. Um, the main thing to see here, though, is, it's a little hard to understand, is that the canvas actually stays still. So the canvas covers the whole map, and it doesn't move with the map. And the difference is what you're doing is instead logically moving the content. And so there's a callback every frame, so on, on a request animation frame, uh, to redraw the content. And for 2D Canvas, it's not that important. You could, you could kind of do some tricks. But for WebGL, it turns out it's really important because every wasted pixel in WebGL ends up being, or it's, it's um, possibly a significant cost uh, with wasted pixels. So you don't want anything sliding off screen that you can't see, and you don't want to allocate a bigger canvas than than you need. Um, so that's what we do. And so, so it's just something to, that you have to deal with when you're dealing with Canvas Layer. But it's not terribly difficult to understand. So I thought I, OK. I don't know what's going on. So Canvas Layer is created like a lot of Maps API objects. You create a Canvas Layer uh, with a constructor. You pass it a configuration object. The most important things are the map that you want to actually put it on and the update function, so that function that's called back every frame. Um, there's other options. It's all in the docs if you want to take a look. And so here's an example of the 2D transformation that we're doing, and, uh, and there's a direct analog to it in WebGL. So we're calculating a scale. So as you zoom in, you can think of the world as scaling rather than zooming. And uh, it's to the power of the zoom. And then you, you have an offset, which is just the translation as you pan around. And then the context.scale and context.translate are part of the 2D drawing API that actually let you transform the, the canvas. So then I can just say draw a box or draw a square, and it will correctly place it. Um, so that's the 2D canvas, uh, and we don't care about it anymore. So we have a canvas that we can draw to. We have data from an awesome black box. It's covered really well, 1245, all the ships in the world. It should go. Um, and we need to get the data from there into, into the canvas. So there's a couple of different ways. Oh, that's exciting. OK, whatever. Um, so we have CSV, which ends up poorly wrapping often. Um, and uh, that's the tried and trusted way, you know, whatever. If you, if you really like spreadsheets, um, if you know people that really like spreadsheets, you probably could get CSV uh, pretty quickly. Uh, there, a million libraries can, can import it and uh, parse it for you. If you go talk to the Perf Matters guys down the, down the hall or upstairs at, in, the, in the Chrome booth area, they'll tell you not to mess with this too much. As, as it gets bigger, you start generating a lot of strings. And modern JavaScript engines are really good at uh, doing offsets into strings because strings are, are read-only. Uh, but you can quite easily generate a ton of garbage, and, and then everything slows down. So that's no good. So we'll look for something better. JSON is the, the classic thing. Um, hopefully everybody's familiar with JSON. It's, it's, uh, it has a nice direct translation to the object literal from JavaScript, which is what JSONP is based on. And then all the, all the browsers for, for years now have had support for json.parse, which is a, a native uh, method to safely parse JSON into, into JavaScript objects. It's really fast. There's a couple of downsides. People tend to make deep objects with JSON even without meaning to. GeoJSON is a really beautifully uh, simple format, and yet people still end up taking features and putting them in feature sets. And then they have geometries, but they're also siblings to other features which have feature sets. And, and you end up having to write general tree callers just to, to find all the things. Uh, the other thing is just size. Uh, so the numeric type in JavaScript is a 64-bit float, and that's eight bytes on the wire. And you can see that. Right here we have some, some lat longs or something. And, um, and every character over eight characters is something, an, an extra byte. And um, you actually want that because you want the precision. A floating point, a 64-bit floating point has like 14 decimal places of precision. And so you want that, but uh, you start wasting space. Uh, Gzip does help. Don't let you know, me make it sound too bad. But, uh, you, do, you do end up paying the price. So all of which is to say the, the most beautiful thing, the wonderful thing, uh, is uh, typed arrays. So typed arrays came along with WebGL. Is everybody familiar with uh, typed arrays? Yes? No? OK. So typed arrays are kind of what you would think in C as just uh, as an array. It's a contiguous block of bytes. And you say to the browser, give me these number of bytes. 
and, uh, and then you can just fill it in with whatever you want. And so uh, what's great about that is when you get a message from a server with XHR2, which has been around for a little while now, uh, you can actually set the response type on your XHR. And, uh, and so that basically tells the browser, don't mess with anything here. Don't parse. Don't send it through some string engine and back to binary or something awful. Uh, just, give me the, just give me the bytes directly. And so you can see here that what I'm doing is I, I take this resp dot response, which is the array buffer, and then I'm putting it in a float32 array. Um, and so I think a lot of people, when they, they encounter typed arrays, they, they think of float32 array and int32 array and float64 array. Um, because you think of it, it's, it's a typed array. You have a typed data type throughout an array. But actually, th those are what are called typed array views. And it's great because you can actually have multiple views on the same buffer. So if, say you had, for instance, alternating float and ints. So, so in the data that we're about to see, uh, our timestamps couldn't fit in a float32 without losing precision. And so we can fit them in an int32. And so I can actually get two views. I could do a new int32 array on this dot response and just alternate as I, as I iterate through the array and take a look at them because they just interpret the, the underlying bytes the way that you tell them to. So they're, they're my favorite thing. They let us like have JavaScript the way that we want it. You know, there's the loose like scripty, just throw it out on the page that everybody does, and then there's like the snooty, like I do everything with promises and wrapped up callbacks, and if it's not a monad, then I you know I don't want to hear about it. And then there's the uh, you know, asm JS hacker types that just want to do some bit twiddling sometimes, and we can merge all of them, and it's beautiful. So. I apologize for taking this long to actually draw something. So let's take a look at some really simple points. So this is taking data from the, all the ships in the world. And this is actually the query is, what are all the latest positions uh, of ships that you've seen? So the, the satellite actually is in a polar orbit. And so it only sees ships every once in a while, whenever they're underneath. And so typically, uh, I don't remember my orbital mechanics exactly, but it depends on the Earth turning actually underneath the polar orbit uh, to see everything. And so. Uh, it only sees what, what's in its line of sight, and so there's a certain amount of time since you've last seen a ship. And if ships turn off their receivers, we might not see them for months. Um, so here's an image of all of them. And as of this morning, I think it was about, about 79,000 points. Um, so if you are familiar with, the, with kind of web mapping, this is actually a, a huge amount of points. Um, it's not unheard of. It's not, it's not completely out, out of uh, like a normal range. But typically, with regular markers, you might have a few hundred. You can use optimized markers or some kind of canvas tricks for more than that. Uh, but what we have here is, is kind of very quickly interactive. And remember um, that uh, this is actually redrawing every frame uh, that, that's actually being done. And so it's actually, it's actually quite nice and fast. So this is just a very simple drawing. I'm just taking the lat long and I'm filling kind of a box around it. So that's great. And we can see already that we have plenty of performance room that we can start kind of abusing our GPU, because what are those fans for but running at full speed? <laughs> Makes sense to me. Um, so uh, just to give you kind of a, a look at, at what we're doing to get those, those blocks on screen, um, if you've never seen WebGL code before, uh, this might be a little shocking. It's a very C-like API that was on purpose to make it very easy to port old OpenGL code. It's really not that bad, and there's a ton of libraries out there to, to wrap it. Um, I personally would suggest 3JS. I don't use it that, that much, but uh, it's, uh, there's a huge community to support that, and the 3JS people are, are so fast on Stack Overflow, I never get to answer anything. Um, so, they're ready to help you, and, and it wraps in a, in a bunch of kind of very familiar JavaScript kind of uh, objects and, and helper classes. So you get, it can help you out. But here's just looking at, at raw web, WebGL. So we get a WebGL context by asking. So Canvas Layer has a canvas on it, and we ask for the, the, the WebGL context. I put this in specifically on its own slide because I'm really excited. It used to be experimental WebGL until a few months ago. Uh, WebGL was finally ratified, and it's now no longer experimental. We have enough conforming browsers. Uh, to do it, and uh, so that's Firefox, and we have Chrome, and Opera on Windows, I think, um, and then Firefox on mobile, 
Chrome on mobile if you go to About Flags and turn it on. And then Safari as well if you go to the developer menu and turn on WebGL. So, so we have a lot of platforms available. That's a huge amount of market share depending on how you count it. And then I'll let you, you know, search on the web for, I don't know, IE11 and WebGL and you might find some interesting rumors, but I won't comment. Um, so I am encouraged though. So this is kind of uh, pretty typical WebGL code. Again, don't, don't worry too much about the specifics, but what this is doing here is we're creating a buffer. Web, WebGL is very state-based, um, and so you create buffers and then you say, WebGL, here's my current buffer, like bind this, and now I want to give this data to the current buffer rather than saying, current buffer, here's some data. It's kind of, uh, it feels a little bit, you know, I don't know. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. We're binding a buffer and we're passing raw data here. And if you remember, raw data was our, that array buffer that we got off the wire from our XHR. And now we can just pass it directly into WebGL. It's a beautiful thing. If you don't have to do any processing, if you've already processed on the server, you can just pass it on in and, uh, and no work needs to be done. So that's the, the fastest thing to compute is, is no computation. So, and then you do this thing where you bind it to uh, a variable to these shaders that I'm about to show you. And, uh, and you tell it these kind of esoteric long string of, of parameters here, but I'm telling it it's, a, it's a, a vector of two components, so it's a latitude and longitude, and uh, it's, the type is float, and it, I tell it where to find it in the array, and it's just lat long, lat long, lat long, lat long, right in one long array. So then we create what are called shaders, and uh, they're kind of a misnomer. Uh, they used to be just for shading, but now we can pretty much use them for whatever we want. There's a great uh, blog series by Greg Tavares, who's uh, an engineer on Chrome, and it's called WebGL is a 2D API, and it's a, it's a really great look at um, how with the way that, that GPUs have kind of generalized that uh, the 3D is kind of incidental. You can, do, you know, it's very uh, optimized for 3D, but we think of kind of what these 3D APIs as a means to games and things like that, but there's no reason for that. We can draw fancy 2D things, for instance. Um, so we, we create these shaders, and they're special programs in a, in a special scripting language that um, is, a, is a different language than JavaScript, but it is very C-like, and it's, uh, it's very small, so there's not much to learn, and it's highly typed. So it's easy to make a mistake, but you know pretty much instantly because the compiler complains um, quite, frequently, or quite quickly. Um, so you, you create your shaders, and you bind them. And so what happens on the inside is you've told it that your array is broken up into x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y. And so the GPU actually has a ton of essentially uh, parallel processors uh, all on its chip. And it can run these extremely quickly and a lot of them at once. This, this machine, for instance, is just a laptop and it has a few hundred um, that it can, can run these calculations uh, at the same time. So it runs a bunch of things through. Um, and so you run it through this vertex shader. And here's a very simple vertex shader. I'm taking a, that world coordinate, that lat long. I'm taking a, a matrix that encodes that scale and translate, and then I'm just multiplying it. And WebGL has a, or GLSL, the language, has a bunch of handy uh, things like four vectors and four by four matrices and things like that. So don't, don't worry too much if you're not big on this. There's, like I said, there's lots of libraries to kind of help you out. But the point is the vertex shader the output here in this vertex shader is GL position, the global that you write to. And all you have to do is write somewhere on the screen between negative one and one and X and negative one and one and Y. And as long as you do that, it's gonna be on screen. If it's off screen, then it's gonna get clipped somehow. Um, and so that's all, all the vertex shader is responsible for is, is outputting an XY coordinate. And then you can include extra coordinates if you're gonna be in 3D and, and can absorb it later on the, down the pipeline. So depending on, on what you told WebGL you're drawing, uh, in this case, we might have said, uh, I'm drawing triangles. And so it'll actually take the three XY's uh, pairs in a row and bind them together in a triangle. And so then it says, OK, these three are in a triangle. You told me three positions on the screen. So every pixel inside that logical triangle, I'm going to fill in. And there's rules for kind of those partial, partial pixels, which ones are filled and which ones aren't. And then finally, the last part of the pipeline is for each of those pixels, you get to run a, another program. So you can run even more computations per pixel, uh, which gets kind of crazy. And that's what kind of separates this from Canvas uh, 2D, especially, even as Canvas speeds up and even as 
SVG speeds up, uh, there's really nothing that can compare to like running a, a rather complex program per, per pixel. And again, the frag shader, the fragment shader only has one job, is, is to output a color. So I create a little thing that lets you edit shaders. And so this is the shader that's actually running on that map that we just saw, just to remind you. Here it is. So we're drawing squares, black squares. So in this case, we have one, one point. And so in my vertex shader, I'm just directly outputting the x, y, which is 0, 0. And I'm using points this time, which come out as little sprites. And I'm saying that the point size, which is the other variable you can output for points, it's 256 pixels across and 256 pixels downwards. And then finally, the fragment shader, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I'm just outputting. I'm saying for every pixel that's in this, in this point, I'm outputting an, an RGBA of, of black, so 0, 0, 0, 1. And so finally, when I run that, I have my black pixel. So that's very exciting. But we can do better than that. So it turns out, um, as I said, you can run whole programs in these things, and, and people actually run incredibly complex programs. If you've ever looked at Shader Toy, um, it's actually designed specifically just to draw a single uh, or two triangles to fill up the whole screen, and then everything else is run per pixel, uh, and you can run very elaborate, even ray tracing just uh, through that one pixel. So we can, do, we can be simpler than that, but uh, we can use this built-in variable called GL point coordinate, which is within this square. And the point coordinates of the square has yet a different coordinate system, which is great. But it basically runs from 0, 0 to 1, 1, like that. Um, and so the center of it is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So I can say that the, the distance um, for a particular pixel, so remember this is running per pixel, uh, is, this, is equal to the length of GL point coordinate, the x, y uh, components of that and then subtracted from a vector of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which is the center. And, uh, and so that's my distance from the, the center of that circle. And so I just want to test it. Um, we'll say alpha is equal to, if distance is greater than 0.5 away, so past that circle, then let's uh, make that an alpha of zero, otherwise let's make it opaque, and now we can just multiply our color by alpha, and that's not right. Luckily we have a debugger. No matching overhead found. Which line? Back two, there we go. So now I've clipped everything past 0.5 distance away from the center, and I've colored it uh, or I've, I've made it transparent. And so now if we look over here in our points, we can do the same thing, and we can make nice blue circles. So already we have a slightly better looking map, um, and, uh, and that's, just, that's just the start. So, so the next thing we, we might want to do is, is so we, now we have a representation. Sorry, we have a representation now. We have our other points on the map, and actually we should take a look at this. I've looked at this too much, and so I get jaded. So this is uh, about 79,000 ships uh, over the last uh, month or two. Uh, and it's, they're older than you know, last week if, they, if they've docked and they've, they've stopped there and actually turned off their transceiver, um, or you know, something's, something's messed up, or sometimes the ships even change call signs and IDs, and so you think the ship is gone, but really it's a new ship. But you can see lots of interesting things. So already we can tell like, where the major shipping lanes are, where a lot of ships are. Um, these are actually, they have a slight alpha on them. And so you can see when they, when they really bunch up here that uh, they, there, there are quite a few. And then there's amusing things like uh, where people are very strict about uh, shipping lanes, like down here, or where they're less strict about shipping lanes, where they just kind of go for it. So, and then you can see, obviously, one of the busiest shipping uh, kind of straits, I don't know, uh, in the world is, is right through here. And so uh, a huge number of shipping companies pass through there. And we can come over here, and there's interesting things. You can see uh, the Panama Canal. You can see ships approach. 
and come in and then fan back out. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite cool. So this is, this is our representation. We can, we can go with this for now. And, uh, and uh, so we want to start mining is the next Ben Fry stage. And uh, we, so we need, we need data. We need to be able to like, kind of pick into this. And, uh, and so when I say picking, I mean it. So uh, picking points, picking is the kind of classic graphics term for uh, like literally saying like, I pick that, like where your mouse is. Um, and so it's, it's basically sampling what is at that, that place that you, you pointed and, or you clicked and, uh, and, and giving you something back. Now, one of the, the advantages that, that uh, kind of SVG fans tout about SVG is that there are actually elements in the DOM, and so you can add a, a click event to it, and, uh, and it works just like any other click event in a browser. And it is great, but it, you know, it runs into trouble when you, you can't really add uh, 80,000 points to an SVG uh, element and, and expect it to, uh, to perform well yet. You know, they, keep, they keep improving. So we have to do it manually, which is no fun. Um, and so I've written some code that does this. And actually, 3JS has a, has a, has a picking uh, library. I've never used it in 2D, but um, I think it should work. And so the key is right here, the GL read pixels right here in the, in the middle. And uh, what you do is you transform the world so that, that where you just clicked is now at 0, 0, and you just say, read me back from that OpenGL uh, frame buffer what color is at that pixel. Uh, and you only want one pixel because it's actually, um, where are we? Yep. There we go. You just want one pixel because it's actually quite expensive to bring stuff back from the GPU, just as it's expensive to push things. Expensive relative to uh, a steady frame rate. So you, know, you might pay uh, even five milliseconds for this call, and, and, it, and the latency increases as, as the amount of memory uh, increases that you want to bring over. So I included this code just because I love typed arrays so much right at the top. So what I do is I first create a, a read bytes, and, uh, and it's a uint8 array. So, it, so it's an array of four bytes. And, uh, and then I take a pixel read int, so the type is int, and it's an int32 array of the, the buffer of that uh, uint8 array. So it's taking that four byte array and shoving it into a single int. And what's cool about this is when you sample a color from the screen, it's, a, it's an RGBA, and it's fitting into four bytes. And, uh, and so I can, I can read those separately. It'll be like 255, like 128, 36, and then one or whatever for alpha. Or sorry, 255 for one for alpha. Um, but then I can look down here at the bottom, this last line, and I can do a lookup table on the int value of that. So I can make a table of values. And as long as my values fit into an int, I can then just shove them into a color, uh, and OpenGL will just treat it as a color. And so that's exactly what I've done. So I, I have a, an ID for each ship, and uh, I shove it into a color. And I never actually draw it on screen, but we can look at it. And it's really pretty. It's kind of uh, unpleasant to look at, but it doesn't matter because we never see it. And it's because each of these is a unique color. We have a huge, we have a huge range here. Alpha gets a little tricky, but we have at least 24 bits of, of ints and um, of values. And so what happens is I, I click on here, and I get the single pixel that's under my mouse. And I read back what uh, that, that ID, and then I can look up in a table uh, to find it. And so let's find out. We actually have different amounts of data for different types of ships. So here's the new venture. It's a cargo ship. We last saw it on May 5th, and it's uh, speeding ahead at 11.8 knots um, on a course of 27.4 degrees, so mostly north. Um, and meanwhile, uh, let's find a different one with the. Oh, come on. There we go, the Falcon Traveler. Ooh, it's another cargo ship, um, but it's traveling south. So, so we can now do that, and so now when we see kind of curious ships, like say in the middle of nowhere in land, uh, we can be like, well, what's going on here? And so uh, we don't have a, a ship name, uh, but we can then use the MMSI, which is there, which is kind of an ID uh, for that you have to register somewhere. And we can look it up. We can even look up the, the, uh, the country and then the registration office. Um, and so usually what happens is it's a mistake. So either the, the GPS and the ship messed up, or uh, there's even cases where like lightning has struck the, the uh, GPS antenna and fried electronics, and suddenly a ship will be teleporting all over Earth. And um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to tell if it's a mistake or not, because a lot of this 
is standardized in a way that allows you to just like, uh, you know, you come on shift and you're just a guy and you're kind of on the deck and you're typing in your ship ID and hopefully you got it right because you're broadcasting to the world who you are. So a lot of it is not automated, so it can be very messy and, and all the ships in the world cover some of that, um, how you kind of figure out if two ships have the same ID and one's in South America and one's in England, maybe they're not the same ship, but then you really hope that they never come together because then you can't tell them apart. Um, okay, so now we have, we, have, um, we have picking, so we can kind of dig a little bit deeper. Um, I really like that you can see ships on the Mississippi. I think that's awesome. So now we can dig a little bit deeper. So, yeah, okay. So um, we actually get more complicated data down from the server than just X, Y coordinates. Um, we actually can get a, a whole bunch of attributes that come with the ship. So ships actually broadcast quite a bit more. They, they broadcast, uh, well, as, as you've seen from the, the info windows, they broadcast the direction they're traveling, the, their current speed, and then um, uh, so, some other attributes. And so what we can do is actually take those and shove those into WebGL as well. And even though they're not spatial coordinates, we can use those to do the same thing we're doing here, color them by, by that value. So let's see, is this what I want to do? Yes. So this is one that, that seems like it's going to be, it's just as ugly as the, the picking one. But actually, you'll, see, you'll start to see some coherence in the colors, especially around places like here, um, where you can see that there's obviously a line of ships of the same color. And then we come down, and, uh, and you'll see even here where you have much more distinct, uh, it's kind of party colors, um, very distinct shipping lanes. And so uh, what we're doing is, is, this is not, you know, I'm not a designer. But uh, if I was, this would look prettier. But what I'm doing is just taking the, the, the course that the ship is traveling in and just taking the, the kind of color wheel of, of hues and, and assigning a direction to a hue. So north is red, and then it goes from there. Um, and so what we can see here is coherence in, um, in direction traveling. And so remember, we're, we're just exploring data here. This is not, you wouldn't want to you know, send this to your end user. But you can start to see, first of all, you can sanity check, is my data correct? Like, yes, so like, if I look in the Suez Canal, typically ships are moving in the same direction. You, know, you might lose your, your, your heading if you're still, for instance, so we can't be totally sure um, that, that those aren't errors, but we see enough coherence that this is actually uh, a, uh, a valuable insight into the data. And then we can also start seeing things like this, where as a person who doesn't know that much about shipping, I immediately suspect that this is a major shipping channel and that it must be um, you know, either advantageous enough to cut across like this, because it's a, a, a short distance and I, it's near the equator, so it could be a great circle, um, or it's, uh, it's some kind of mandated thing by governments or something like that. And you can even see, if, if, as you get close, that the ships on top are very distinctively going uh, not that guy. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, 269, which is west or east for you, or west for you, that way. And then, um, and then the guys in the bottom are going the opposite, opposite way, almost directly. So almost directly east, east, west. So that's great. And in fact, you can assign any, any color to those things um, that you want. So then, um, so then the last thing is, is that you want to start getting insight into uh, uh, more than that. So we can look at this, and it's difficult because there's a lot of data on screen. It's, it's difficult to kind of get a feel for, for what's going on, especially like in Confettiville over here um, in, the, in the Gulf. So, um, and this isn't unexpected. There's actually a bunch of oil platforms out here and ships that go to and from, and then a bunch of tankers as well. And oil platforms, I didn't know this until recently, oil platforms actually count as ships, and so they actually broadcast their, their IDs because they usually... I guess they're tethered, but, and, and actually they might be drilling unless they're refineries, but, um, but they're floating. So, and this is also, I, this is like party town. Um, so what we can do is, is actually get another view into the data. And so I, I actually really like this, and it's difficult to, to uh, explain why, because it's not that interesting, but... Um, it's, it's, if you think of it as of the, 
classic like kind of model view controller. Um, we've actually kind of split both the model and the view, um, well, depending on how you de define them, but whatever, um, into a, a GPU side and a, and a CPU side. So we have a, a GPU side that's taken, we've, we've loaded all our data over there, and the only things that we send over are things like, well, here are the lat longs, so only draw the things in that lat long, and only scale it by this amount, and don't draw anything off the screen. Um, meanwhile, on the CPU side, I do things like read back from the GPU, but all I'm re reading back is that one index. And so we can take that further and actually do computations on the CPU, and that's great, because the CPU's not doing anything while the GPU's crunching away at these numbers. And, uh, and if we really want to hit those fans at full speed, what we can do is, is actually plot things. So this is, um, can you see that? I wonder if I can, yeah? I mean, the country's all messed up now, but. There we go. So we lost some, some crispness, but that's okay. It's, it's better to see this, this big. So what this is, is it's a histogram of the, the speeds of the ships, uh, and it changes as we go around. It actually changes the, the current view of the speeds of the ships. So we can see, for instance, that, um, so first of all, the thing that always wins is zero over here. So there's always enough ships at rest that, that that's gonna be the biggest bucket. And in fact, the bucket goes like, like up to India here. Um, but I clipped it off because it makes everything else very small if I normalize by that. And so remember, this is a distribution. So this is not a count. This is not a, a, a bar graph of the total. This is just taking a look at if you count uh, the current ships on screen as 100%, this is a division of that full, um, that full distribution. So you can normalize in your head by whatever, two, root 2 pi, whatever. Um, so what's interesting about this is you can start to see well, A, everybody seems to travel about 12 knots, which is uh, a little slower than I would have thought. Um, but you can see definite patterns, so where's a good pattern? So off this eastern seaboard, um, people are kind of doing a lot of shipping. And so, uh, and so you have these ships coming in uh, from across the ocean, and so they're, they're tend to go pretty fast, because if you lose your, your, or you spend more time at sea, the more expensive it, it is. But as I was mentioning, in the Gulf, um, it's quite a, a bit different. Um, you actually have very slow ships. So first of all, your oil platforms aren't necessarily moving. They might fall in the zero category, but the ships that service them are also quite slow. And so you actually have, as you come around here, you have this really nice bimodal distribution, which you never get to see enough of, um, where you have definite slow ships and you have fast ships. And so this can help you, you know, start to investigate your data, and then you can start looking at things like, so what I've done here is actually, you can, it's hard to tell, but I've actually colored it. Um, I'm bending by... Um, everything that's, that's this light blue, um, which is an unfortunate choice, but that's okay, um, is, uh, is, is not moving. And everything that's dark blue is moving at some speed. And you can even color it by the same way that we do, of course. So that's, um, that's kind of looking at this thing. And this is, so this is, I should say, this is uh, using the cross filter library that comes from, uh, Mike Bostock wrote it. And then it's drawn with D3, which Mike Bostock also wrote. Um, is the is a little histogram. It's basically the simplest little histogram that you can write, but um, you can drop this in for any variable in the data set. Um, and actually, so this afternoon, when the, all the ships in the world shows, we actually have a few more that we can show that time, but I need to press on. So the last thing I wanted to show before we go, go to questions um, is uh, that, you know, here I showed that you can clip the alpha and have a distinct circle. And so this is actually drawing a square still, but it's just drawing invisible pixels around the, around the, um, around the circle. But there's no reason that we have to do that. So what we could do instead is actually, is actually draw with functions. So for instance, instead of doing distance as this length and then cutting off the alpha, we could instead do something like um, take uh, the distance and set it equal to, what's it, one, minus dist times two. And so if you remember, the distance to the edge is 0.5, because that's the, the edge of the circle. So we multiply it by two to get to one, and then we invert it so that one is at the center, or zero is at the center. No, one is at the center, yeah. And so now if we take this dist, and we actually shove it in, and uh, actually, no, we want to do one thing just in case. Dist equals max zero. So we clamp it at zero so we don't draw out of range. We can now do something like this. 
what you see is, is uh, you quickly get a function. And so, or it's a, sorry, it's a, a fall off function that's, that's, um, that's put on top of that dot. And actually, so you can do anything here, and, and you can do quite complicated things. Um, and so what you can start thinking about is taking functions and geometry and what's called convolving them. And so you can actually have a, a function that's spread out over geometry. And that's the last thing I want to show you. Um, if we think about, instead of points, we say, OK, so these, this is the latest positions of these ships. What about if we look at um, the paths that these ships have actually traveled? So that was about 79,000 um, ships. And uh, instead, we're going to look at about 20,000, so less ships, but we're actually going to look at a bunch of data points per ship. And so we're going to end up with about 2 million paths on screen. And uh, as we, how are we doing there? Yeah? OK. Let it load. So as we, there we go. So you should see, there we go. It's a little difficult to see with these lights, that's unfortunate. Oh well. Um, so what you can see now is, as we zoom in, you can actually see these ships moving. Um, and you can see some of the errors in the data where they cut, and cut, cut across Saudi Arabia. Partly that, that's just um, the sampling of the data. You know, if a ship has made it around the, the Cape there then they, in a day, then, then they'll be drawn straight through it. But you can quickly see, as it, as it builds up, that uh, you can see those same shipping lanes building up. And, uh, and we can do things like um, fall off to blue and, uh, and more transparent over time. And so the, the newer ships, the ships that are actually passing by, are these bright orange. And the older ships are the darker pink. And, um, and then we can do things. It's difficult to see, but um, it's easier. We, you can come up to the sandbox afterwards and, and come see it for yourself at full. It's a retina, retina screen, too. Um, but what we're actually doing is, is taking an error function, and we're putting that over the line. So it's not just a line, it's also an error function. And it's an attempt, I'm, I'm kind of playing around with, uh, can we take GPS error and kind of uh, visualize it? So we have an uncertainty of where the ship is. We know it was here, and we know it was here, through, with some amount of error. And we know it got between them somehow. And so we want to start thinking about, like, can we quantify the error, and can we draw it by actually spreading out, kind of having like a, a sum of all possible ships that that go through. Um, and so it's a pretty fun area. And uh, I think we're just uh, starting with that particular thing. Um, but uh, polylines are something that have been ignored for too long is kind of an a interesting geometric thing, especially in maps. Because while we can drive uh, polylines, it turns out polylines are, are expensive and in many ways more expensive than polygons to draw. Um, and uh, I did want to show just a couple of things. I can leave it while uh, I go for questions, but you can see already some interesting things that we couldn't pick up in just the point data, like here around Iceland. Um, you can, is that okay, go ahead. There they are. You'll see there's definite ships that are, are uh, tracking and, and doing cargo, um, but then as we get close to the end here, you'll see uh, fishing vessels go out and kind of swirl around and come back in, and uh, you can only see that pretty much through the behavior of the lines, uh, which is pretty cool to see. Um, so I'll open it up for questions. We have a Eight minutes. I apologize for going over. Um, there's a lot more to show, so I'll just kind of uh, go. I like this area in Alaska too. But um, so I just wanted to say thank you. And um, as I said, there's a bunch of resources online, a bunch of libraries for WebGL. Um, Canvas Layer, if you look for it, it has two uh, sample apps. They're very simple a 2D app and a WebGL app just to get you started. Uh, and the 2D app does, I think, exactly what you saw it draws a square. And the WebGL app just generates a bunch of random points and plops them down on a map so you can kind of use it and, and copy it. And I think there was even a blog post where somebody deciphered my, my code and made it nicer. So you might look for that, too. So uh, if anybody has any questions, please come up to the mic and, uh, and ask away. So when you're coloring on a pixel by pixel basis, how do you do things like sprites? Do you have a buffer that represents the sprites? Then you look at the pixel offset in there and draw that color at that exact point? Or how do you do more complex things than dots? Oh, more complex things than yeah. dots? So do you want to, so you're asking about sprites, like, like image sprites. Mm. Yeah, so, so obviously, um, you know, 
this 3D stuff is used for games all the time. And so games are, are often based on actually texturing and things. And so, yeah, you just load up a bunch of images onto your GPU. And then you can just, uh, yeah, you, you get those pixel offsets. The same thing I was using for the function to do a, a distance. You can use that to look up into your sprite. And you say, like, this is a gray pixel. This is a you know, red pixel. This is a gray pixel. And it seems like it would be slow, but it's not. And you get your little you know, 2D sprite art. Um, before you know it. So yeah, so that's typically what and, you can do. And also, is that, shader, is that shader playground that you use to like interactively show the changes? Is that available online? Uh, I can put it online. It's dead simple, but yeah, I, I, can, I can put it online. Hi. Yeah, I have a simple question yes. about um, plotting the, the items on the map. So I would need something like, will it be possible for uh, those points to have like uh, uh, an additional bigger circles, like a radius. So uh, my, my current project is I need to have a visualization uh -huh. for overlapping schools, public schools, particularly in the Philippines. Yeah. So I would need to have like um, for like a radius of five kilometers. Right. Uh, I need to indicate if they're like um, overlapping schools within like a five kilometer five kilometer radius. So how many how many schools are you are you talking about? Uh, I would be plotting like around seventy thousand schools. Oh, so a lot. Okay. Yeah. So yes. So I actually limited the circles because they get um, they get so big after a while that if okay. you lose all context, you can't see the map anymore. Um, but uh, yes, they can they can be arbitrarily big. There okay. are some limits with points, point sprites, uh, but you can then just switch to triangles and pretending they're point sprites. It's, okay, it's, it's, so uh, um, that's possible, right? So yeah. I could like um, I could see like I could like um, mark it as red yeah. for those schools who like overlap for like uh, I, let's say I have a uh, I could adjust it like two yeah. kilometers, five kilometers. So there's a couple of different ways you could do that. Um, you can just do it with plain color if it's just for visual display. Um, you could also use what's called the stencil buffer, where you can actually use, it's like a secondary buffer where you can do more logical operations, like checking for intersections and things like that. And you could even do something if you had the colors, you could then do that read back thing that I did for, for picking, and you could even read the color back and know like, okay, this is intersection of this kind of school and this kind of school, um, if you wanted to do that. It might be faster to do that side on the CPU, it's always a, a trade-off, but sometimes it's easier to just shove it on the GPU and say, take care of it, and GPUs tend to be so fast these days that um, at least for you know a prototype, it, it's fast enough, um, and then you just need to evaluate on a real hardware and see if it's it's fast enough there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you obtain a similar effect uh, in Google Earth, and can you do it uh, sharing the same pieces of code? It would be awesome to do it in Google Earth. Um, okay, if I understand your question, so you're asking if you can do this. Like uh, take can, Google Earth and draw the same things yeah, on the, on the 3D planet. 3D animations. It would be Google. awesome. So, but Google Earth is uh, is a C plus plus program, and it, and it's more difficult to kind of insert yourself into that kind of program, um, and so uh, it's difficult to share the context, especially if you want to do things like uh, you know properly draw on terrain and not self intersect it and stuff like that. Because if they've done any tricks, it you you would definitely be hacking. It would not be. Um, uh, you know, getting along like you know harmoniously. Um, I think it would be great to do that though, and I think um, there. Are, I mean, some of this is, is very possible with KML. Um, usually not on on this scale. Usually not in the, the tens of thousands of, of polylines, um, especially if they're long enough. Um, but uh, I think you know we're starting to see more and more stuff move to the browser, kind of with this uh, the new maps and things like that. And I think I would love to see see this kind of thing, you know, just plop it right on top of WebGL uh, globe. I think that would be amazing. We'll, we'll see if that, that happens. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I noticed you said you had about 70,000 points. Yes. And then here you were talking about millions. Like, Sorry. what are the limits? I, I, I didn't understand. I have a second right. question, too. So the, it was 79,000 okay. uh, in the first one. And it, it was just a query, like, a, like uh, literally a query of the database saying, for every unique ID you have, show me the most recent uh, like time-stamped uh, message you have from them. And so we have 79,000 ships that fall within. We had a couple of things like it, it can't be, uh, there's a bunch of like things with, with obviously wrong data, like either their machines messed up or we're parsing it wrong or the satellite picked it up wrong. But my so, we're, so we're leaving them out. So th that's the good 79,000 that, that are within like the last three months or something. Um, so for this, this is actually fewer points. So this is 20,000 ships, so it's fewer ships. Oh, this one. Uh, but it's 2 million uh, uh, line segments is what we end up drawing. 
And, uh, and actually, the frame rate's good enough that I was thinking about bumping it up, but I, I didn't have time. But and my question is, what is the limit? Like, let's say you had a million points. Yes. So a million points is definitely doable. It depends on the hardware. So um, you might have more difficulty on older hardware. And it's difficult to, right now, get the feedback you need to from the browser. Um, there are a bunch of uh, browser extensions that you can run to get that feedback, but it's hard to ask like, a, an end user to run that and say, like, can you, you know, copy and paste with that, just print it out. Um, and so, um, but uh, I run regularly on here up to uh, 10 million points, maybe. Wow. And at that point, you, and that's mostly brute force, actually. Um, as long as it's not on screen, you, don't, it, you can actually cue it, uh, call it quite quickly. And, uh, and if it is on screen, you can do things like uh, be careful of your, your alpha so you're not drawing too much. Um, but then you can start doing things like actually uh, uh, partitioning it spatially so you can do things like only draw between these latitudes and these longitudes. And so you actually save a bunch of, of time that way. And so, but yeah, so just brute force, like draw it all on screen. 10 million. It, it depends on the exact blending modes that you're doing and things like that. And the final question is, let's say you're a, a JavaScript, a map programmer, you want to learn this. Is there a good place to start? Yeah, so, so 3JS is a, is a great place to start. I've seen a number of people start with 3JS. Uh, it's a library. Oh, OK. So search Google yeah, on 3JS. 3JS. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have started with that. And if they've wanted to move on to like kind of full WebGL, it's, there's actually there's a few escape hatches where you can say, like, uh, like custom element, and you specify everything uh, yourself. But then lots of it is um, is already made for you, just kind of assemble uh, things that, that are already made. Uh, but the, then the variety that people come up with with that stuff is amazing. Um, there's a few books. The, my favorite book is still um, the OpenGLS OpenGL ES2 Programming Guide. The, it's a purple book, um, and it's not actually WebGL, but it's close enough to WebGL. It's basically a, the mirrored API, but in C. Um, that it's pretty much the same thing. There's also two, at least that I know of, of WebGL books directly. And I haven't read either of them, so I can't vouch for them. But um, one of them is specifically about 3JS. And it's written by Tony Parisi, I think his name is. Tony Parisi. And he runs a, a blog called Learning WebGL Now. And, uh, and it's specifically about that sort of thing. And he has updates every week, like cool stuff that happened around the web. So yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so the, using the, the color as an index for picking is a pretty cool trick, but kind of limited to just uh, you know just picking individual things. So do you have it? Right. You, you, it seems that like for a lot of real world stuff, you quickly fall into sort of spatial partitioning uh, yeah. problems. So or do you have any advice for like how to efficiently, you know, when you've got lar really large data sets, sort of do the spatial partitioning for finding. You know, maybe regions and things like sure, that. Sure, sure. So you're talking like if you wanted to do like a, a range query and say like all the points. So like honestly, it's a little embarrassing to do picking. It's actually nice, nice to show the technique, but it's like the lazy way. Uh, like points especially are like some, one of the easiest things to kind of partition and, and select like the nearest from, um, especially like 80,000 points. So one piece of advice I have would be to trust JavaScript. It's actually much faster than a lot of people give it credit for. Um, you have to kind of sit, stick to sane things, but there's even uh, a lot of profiling tools available now to, to tell you exactly where you screwed up and like um, screwed up in the sense that you angered the JavaScript gods and, and you you know deallocated that something they need, they assumed was allocating and they deopted your your just in time compiled code. Um, and uh, but other than that, I, I mean, it's really just like pretty much the the algorithms that that you expect. So cross filter, which was running that histogram at the bottom is actually doing that. It's, it's, uh, they do range queries in up to 32 dimensions. And uh, it's pretty fast. It's not, it's, WebGL is faster than it. And so it, it can actually slow down the frame rate calculating that. Um, but one thing that you can do, but I've never tried before, is you can run it in a web worker so it's in a different thread. And you actually, you're bringing over just the, the grouped histogram, so it's much less data that you're bringing between processes, threads, it's whatever. Um, and uh, and so you can kind of shove off work there. But I would say really like the, the typical, the, like kind of the space partition algorithms that, that are, are everywhere. And, and hopefully we'll start to see more uh, implementations. Um, I've done a little bit with uh, some computational algebra, computational geometry libraries that you can check out if you check out my GitHub account. Um, and uh, that might be helpful. So yeah. So one more question? 
All right, thank you.